Wednesday night Bible study. We're continuing our summer series this evening, and we'll introduce our speaker in just a couple of minutes. We want to welcome you here tonight. If you're visiting with us, we want to welcome you especially. Uh, and uh, hang around and let us get to know you after service tonight. If you're joining us online, we welcome you and invite you to be a part of our service in person every chance you have the opportunity to be here. We're going to sing a couple of verses of this song tonight, and then John Hillis is going to come and lead us in prayer, and then we will introduce our speaker this evening. Let's sing together. continuing our summer series this evening. I think, I didn't do the math on this and look at the calendar, but I think this marks the halfway point of our summer series this year. And it's been a great summer so far, and we're looking forward to several more weeks of great speakers. And uh, again, we wanted to invite you to come and be a part of that every, every uh, Wednesday night. And uh, we, uh, we would just love to see you visiting with us. Tonight our speaker is Jeremy Hall. Jeremy is no stranger to Millview. He was our pulpit minister here uh, for seven years and left in 2019 to move to Memphis, the Memphis area. And uh, he is now serving as the pulpit minister at the Bartlett Woods Church in Arlington, Tennessee, I believe, which is down close to Memphis. And so uh, we welcome Jeremy and Sarah and their family. And always great to welcome you. It's like coming home, Jeremy. We appreciate you being here tonight. Come speak to us. Good evening. Good evening. The city is ruining your theme because it's come and see 
And when you're driving this way, you cannot see Millview <laughs> at all. They built a mountain in front of Millview. It was crazy. We were coming from this way, and we thought, well, we weren't, we're not going to turn in over there. We'll turn in over here. You cannot turn in over here. So we had to turn around. And then we almost passed it, because then it vanished. And you can't see it. It's crazy. It's, it looks different uh, about every time we come. But uh, it's always good to be here. What, if you were to say <clears throat> what you think is the most famous movie line of all time, what would you put in there? Uh, now, if you were to look that up online, like what's the most famous movie quote of all time, you would find all kinds of lists. And in my search, I had to be very careful because there are certain lists that would, I knew were going to quote Gone with the Wind, which would not have been a good thing. So I was trying to find some of the, the best movie quotes of all time. And the, one of the ones I like is from a, a website called Screen Rant. Uh, and it's a, <clears throat> it's a pretty uh, famous booby site. Uh, and so some of the, the ones you might expect are in there. There's no crying in baseball uh, is in there. You've got uh, uh, the, some from The Wizard of Oz. You've got Hasta La Vista, baby. You've got You Can't Handle the Truth. Uh, but these are the, these are the top five. For better or worse, you may disagree, but these are theirs. Okay. Number five from The Godfather, I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. I think a lot of people know that line and they don't even, they've never even seen The Godfather. I've never seen The Godfather, and I know that line. Number four, from The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. Number three, from Jaws, you're gonna need a bigger boat. <laughs> from Star Wars, may the force be with you. And they say number one is from Casablanca, here's looking at you, kid. Now you, know, you may put something else in there. When I looked at it, there are different lines. Uh, that I would, and if you read down, you know, all of those lines, a lot of the lines in their 50 list could have been in their top five list. <clears throat> but if you were to look at the book of Esther and say, what is the most famous line from the book of Esther? I think if you were to ask, what is the most powerful line, that might be a little bit different. Even with the movie lines, if you ask what's the most famous line versus what's the best line, you might say two different things for those. But within Esther, I would have to say I put... For the most powerful lines, one of them would be that if I perish, I perish. Because that line is unbelievable. You know, I'm going to go for the king. If I perish, I perish. But I would say that maybe the most famous line from Esther is when Mordecai tells Esther in 414, who knows that you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. In fact, there are whole books written that are called by that name, such a time as this. In fact, I think Fried Hardeman's lectures, they were on Ezra and Esther and Nehemiah and uh, this past year. Uh, and I think the sub line was for such a time as this. Uh, it's a really famous line and for a good reason, because the power of it strikes not just at what Esther was going to do, but for us. Because Mordecai's point to Esther was you are uniquely positioned to make a difference. And now you have to decide what to do with it. And the truth is that every one of us is uniquely positioned in some way to make some kind of difference for the kingdom. You know, what kind of life experiences do you now have that because you've experienced those things, you can now help other people and empathize in a way that other people might not be able to do that? What kind of resources do you have, whether that's financially or just resources that you have access to that you can leverage for the kingdom somehow? Who could you mentor? Who could have, is it, are you in position to have the perfect mentor? They're right there. You just need to ask them if, if you can go to lunch with them. In what way are you positioned with gifts and talents to serve in the kingdom? And I would say the same thing to each one of us that Mordecai said to Esther. Who knows but that you have come to this time, to this place, to this city, to this community, to this job that you're in, to this position in your life with these experiences, to this congregation, to this service tonight. For such a time as this, that there are things that you are uniquely positioned to do that no other person can do exactly like you because there's not another you. <clears throat> Mordecai asks Esther this question, but uh, she's not the only person in here that's uniquely positioned. In fact, Mordecai is, and so are other people. And for me, walking through the book of Esther, you see multiple people who find themselves in a position where they either act or somebody else might could, but not in the same way that they could. And it's a succession of different people who make that decision that leads to where they need to be. One of the worst ways to judge your usefulness in God's kingdom is to have a narrow view of what ministry looks like. If your view of what ministry looks like only includes standing in a suit preaching, then you're going to miss so many different forms of ministry. But not because they're not ministry, but because your vision of what ministry looks like is too narrow. 
how you could serve in God's kingdom is, is too narrow. Uh, the, the ability to look around us and find every single thing's use for God in some way positions us for better ministry. The truth is, sometimes ministry, we might think, looks like sitting down having a personal Bible study with somebody. And of course it does. I'm not going to exclude that from ministry. However, the people that you are able to have a Bible study with, who will take you seriously, are often the people you've earned the right to be heard with. And oftentimes that has come through life experiences. It has come through good decisions. It has come through building a relationship with them. It has come through recreation. Because if you are a rested person, you are a more healthy person, and you often have a better attitude, which helps you talk about the joy of the gospel. In other words, everything in your life, if I'm asking the question, how can I use this moment for God? It all becomes a cumulative part of my effectiveness in the kingdom when I talk to somebody about the gospel. Those things we might directly associate with ministry. But it's all a part of that. So I want to ask why these people make these moves. And how can we reflect on that? Take a look at Esther 4, verses 1 through 5. Come on, clicker. You've come to times such as this. This is your moment. You might have to change this last one, Lodi. I'm so sorry. Chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes. Why is he tearing his clothes? The Jewish people are in Persia. They're in captivity there. Esther has become queen. She is a Jew. They don't know that she's a Jew. She's there because the former queen would not parade herself before a group of drunken men. So she was ousted, and Esther won a beauty competition to be put in that place. Her cousin, Mordecai, who is raising her, has ticked off a guy named Haman. He's a high official, and yet he's been offended. Why? Mordecai won't bow down to him like everybody else. And so Haman is upset because he's a Jew. He's not just going to kill and obliterate him. He's going to kill everybody like him. So he's going to obliterate all the Jews. Mordecai finds out about that plot. Obviously, he's distraught. Chapter 4, begin again. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. The king's command is because Haman has convinced the king to fund the execution of the Jews. So this ups the plot, and Mordecai knows this. What were Mordecai's options beyond this grieving publicly? You hear about this plot, what do you do about it? What do you do to stop it? Well, one of the options would be go beg Haman for mercy. It's you are the person that is going to be blamed for the obliteration of an entire people because you wouldn't bow down to Haman. That angered him enough to want to kill everyone like you. So what would you do in that position if you felt the responsibility of the entire Jewish nation on your shoulder? Some people would say, I'm just going to go beg. Like it might not be right to do morally to bow down to Haman, but I'm just going to do it and, and ask for his favor. Or you might run away. <laughs> you might run away and hide and at least save yourself. Just, or not let people know that you were Jewish and, and try to go somewhere else. But what Mordecai does is he doesn't just not run away. He's not even passive about it. He's at the king's gate. Like if there's anywhere you don't want to be when Haman, the high king's official, wants to kill you and the rest of your people, it's right there at the king's gate. And that's where he goes. He sits at the king's gate and he's not quiet about it or trying to hide. He's wailing, and he's wearing sackcloth, and he's had ashes and all of this. But he's there at the king's gate because he's trying to get Esther's attention. He knows that she's there, and he's trying to get her attention. He can't, can't go beyond the king's gate, but he's trying to get her to know. It does. It helps her to know. And here's the deal. Mordecai's public grief gets people's attention and causes things to move. So my question for me would be, do the people around me know the things that grieve me? Do they know the things that 
that frustrate me, that upset me, and do those things align with the things that grieve the heart of God? So if I were to ask the people at my workplace or your workplace or your school or wherever you are on a regular basis and say, what is it that they really care about? Like, what are the things that make them cry? What are the things that make them laugh? What are the things that they are passionate about? What would they say? You know, if they're probably going to talk about different foods or sports or th all kinds of things, and that's perfectly fine. There's Jeremy's passionate about Mountain Dew, and they're right, right? But <clears throat> what, what would be the things beyond those superficials? that they would say, I'm passionate about, that I care about, the things that grieve me. Because the only way they're going to know that is if I talk about those things, if I'm open enough about those things. But if they're like, well, I don't, I don't really know. He doesn't really talk about anything beyond you know, just what we do on a, on a regular basis. But here's the deal is Mordecai's public grief was designed to get people's attention enough to move them to action to make something happen. I can't move people to action to make something happen if they don't really even know what it is I'd like them to move for. So I've got to be willing to make that known to people. Mordecai was willing to make that known even at possible cost to himself for being in the place that he did it. But Mordecai is not the only hero that makes a courageous move here. In fact, one of them we might miss if we're not paying enough attention. Look at verses 6 through 9. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in the front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Reagan was right in his inaugural speech when he said, people who say there are no more heroes anymore just don't know where to look. That sometimes the, the people who play some of the biggest roles are the ones that are either in the background or don't get a lot of attention. I've asked the question before, if, if all of the ways in which you served in God's kingdom, no one would ever know about, would you still choose those paths of ministry? And that's a hard question to ask because deep down in all of our hearts, we like Reagan. So, but, it, but it's a hard question to know. Like, if every path of ministry, if nobody would ever know you did it, would, you, would those still be the ones you would choose? Uh, because sometimes those roles, those are the most important ones. They're the ones that people are willing to do, even though they don't get any credit for that. Hathak is a, what seems like a minor character in this story, but he plays a big role. Because Hathak is obviously a significant person to Esther. She's already sent, she has presumably, queens and harems had tons of eunuchs and tons of servants. She's already sent some out to Mordecai, and he refused them. He doesn't want the new clothes. He doesn't want to stop grieving. So after she sent her first attempt of people, she says, okay, Hathak, you go. So who is this person? Who is Hathak that she believes that he could do something that the rest of them couldn't get Mordecai to do? I don't know. Come as we stand and say, no, I, I really don't know the answer to exactly why. But it's clear to me that Esther has some relationship with Hathak that lets her know he's a person that can get this done when the rest of the group couldn't get it done, or at least has a greater likelihood of doing it. But here's something else that's significant about Hathak. After Mordecai tells Hathak everything and makes his request, Hathak had options. He had options. He is presumably not a Jew. He hears that the king's high official, Haman, is going to kill all the Jews, and the king's already funded this. Now, if Haman gets mad at a guy who doesn't want to bow down to him and then wants to kill the entire nation related to that guy, if you knew that Mordecai was trying to usurp that plan, and you, well, my first thought would be, if, if Haman finds out I knew about this, and I didn't tell him or say anything, or I aided them in this plot by communicating what they wanted me to do. And I, what's he going to do to me? I mean, you have to consider the self-preservation aspect of this between going back from Mordecai to Esther. Do I convey this message? Do I become an accessory to this plot to overthrow this plan of a guy who's going to obliterate a whole nation because a guy wouldn't bow down to him? Hey, that could do that. He could just be quiet. He could go tell Haman, or he could just tell Esther a different version. And maybe Esther would never be any the wiser. 
than, than what Mordecai had actually said. But according to the text, he goes and he reports everything that Mordecai said to him. And we don't have any indication otherwise that he told anybody else anything else or didn't do exactly what he was supposed to do in his job as a courier. He faithfully served her. Did you know that in the warring states period of China, it was illegal to kill the messenger? We get that phrase, like, don't kill the messenger, right? But in the warring states period of China, there was like this unspoken code that you didn't do anything to messengers between armies. And the reason is simple. How else are you going to communicate between armies? If, if you kill every person coming from the other side, they can't get a message from you. They can't call you on the telephone. They can't. We don't have that kind of communication. So you have to send a person to communicate with the other side. So if you kill every person coming, I can't communicate. So there was just this unspoken code of ethics that you didn't kill messengers that were sent between armies. That way you could at least communicate. There's a such thing, too, in, in times past. I don't know what that means. But uh, in, you know, centuries ago, there was the town crier. Have you ever heard of the town crier? This guy's job was to sit in the top of a tower in the middle of town. And if there was danger coming, was to do exactly what his name says and cry. I, I think sometimes, like, how do you qualify for that job? Like, who has the most annoying voice in the whole village that if they wail from the top of that tower? Jeremy, put him up there. Uh, you know, but the town crier, it was actually a, a legal offense. It was against the law to harm the town crier. They rely on that guy because he's at the top of this. He's the one, he's their warning system. So it was against the law to harm the town crier. Like, why are you talking about this? Don't you wish there was an unspoken code of ethics where uh, you, you didn't kill the messenger today uh, when it came to evangelism and speaking about moral uh, issues in public? Uh, don't you wish there was this unspoken code of conduct on social media that people didn't just hound you if you talked about some moral? Unfortunately, that's not the case, which means that to be a messenger for God today, there's no, there's, there's no protection for you from the sacrifices that that will cost. What that means is we have options too, like Hapak. We have been given a message to convey to the world about Christ and about the things that God wants. And we do have options. We have options to tell it a little differently because we know it'll go down better. We have options to not tell it. We might say, I don't, I don't like, I don't not say it. I just don't like say it all the time. Uh, so, but if we're not open enough about the things we believe, we can't make change because those things aren't out there. We just kind of blend in. So like Hathak, we have to be willing to say, I have been uniquely positioned between God and these people in my life. <coughs> And there is a message he wants me to convey to them. And will I convey it faithfully? In love and respect, but faithfully the way that God has called me to do it. Because there are people in your life that you are uniquely positioned to talk to about the gospel. That, that may not be in my sphere of direct influence. That may be in yours. And will we convey the message faithfully to them? Mordecai made the moves. Hathak did it. But then comes the woman of the hour, Esther, of course who makes unbelievably courageous moves. Look at verse 10. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except to the one whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come to the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. The difference between life and death is sometimes one object. Everything about that? That the difference between life and death is one object, a, a vial or dose of medicine, an epipen. Uh, a gas mask or oxygen mask on an airplane. For Theodore Roosevelt, it was I, okay, two things for him. 
It was a folded manuscript speech and a metal eyeglass case in his pocket that stopped an assassination bullet. Like the, the difference between life and death being that singular object. Can you imagine your life hanging in the balance of whether or not you've got a golden stick brought down to you? I mean, all you've done is go to bring a matter before the king, and if he decides he doesn't want to lower that stick to you, you're dead. For a lot of people, I think the time that Esther <laughs> chooses to make her decision is, is frustrating. She's like one of those characters in a movie where they just keep doing things, and you're like, why are you doing that? Or just get it out there and just say something. You want her to act faster, and I'll talk more about that uh, in just a little bit. But Esther's timing is obviously great because it works for her. But she has to make decisions and sacrifices here and a move to use her platform and hopefully influence people to do something about it. She's one more example, though, of a bunch of people in Scripture that didn't know the ending and their decision would cause their death. Right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not know the ending. We do. Like, we have hindsight bias when we read Scripture because we know the ending of the stories that we're reading, at least the second time we read them. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, even if God doesn't deliver us, they explicitly say, it is possible God will not deliver us here. We will still not bow down to you. For all they knew, they were going to burn up in there just like the people who threw them in there, who were starting the fire and, and tossing them in. Daniel did not know the end of the story. For all Daniel knew, the lions were going to tear him to shreds. I was asking Sarah this question earlier. Do you think he tried to pet one of the lions? He was down there all night. It was all night long. Like if you knew, like if their mouth was closed, it had been hours. Hours. Would you have at least? Probably not. Okay. So Daniel, he didn't know the ending, right? And, and he did it anyway. He, he didn't know if he was just going to be tossed down and destroyed. Here's the, here's the difference between them and Jesus, though. He's not a person who made the courageous moves not knowing whether or not he might die. He made them knowing he would die. In fact, he came to die. And yet he still came and, and did that sacrifice at cost because of the things that I have done. Daniel even prays. One of the people, Dan, nothing negative is ever said about Daniel in the book of Daniel. He's one of the few righteous characters in the Bible for whom we don't have any negative things said about him. And yet Daniel in chapter 9 even says we have sinned. He includes himself in that. So if Daniel, you know, got punished for something, Daniel might have, you know, Daniel had done things too. He said, God, you're righteous for punishing us. I'm, Christ had done nothing. And yet he is willing to die. He is willing to go to the cross for us. And as his followers, would we expect that he would ask nothing less of us than a daily death to self? And it's, it's made up in all those little deaths, all those little moments of denying what I want to do and doing the harder thing. Have you ever cried at work? Uh, if you have, it's okay. Uh, a lot of people apparently have. There was a survey done asking people if they had cried at work, and 48% of Americans said they cried at work. This is 2019. I'm sure it's much higher uh, after 2020. No, that, 2019, 48% said they had cried at work. 81% of Americans said stress had impacted their work negatively. We live in a stressful world. If you turn on the news, you see stuff over and over, and then you don't have to turn on the news. Your own life is probably stressful enough. There are difficulties that we go through personally in our communities and in the world at large. But then we ask ourselves, are we the first people, not, not to lessen the stress that we're going through, but are we the first people who have endured such tumultuous times? There was a lot about the year 1961 that was awesome. I'm going to just read you a list from the beginning of 1961 of all the amazing things that were happening. In 1961, the there, was, there was hope that surrounded the inauguration of John F. Kennedy, okay? But all these other great things were happening. January 3rd, we start off the year with a, the U.S. severed diplomatic relations with Cuba. Always a good start. January 9th, the British authorities announced the discovery of a huge Soviet spy ring. Even better. April 12th, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human to travel to space, which signaled that the Soviet Union was growing in superiority to the space race. Not good for Americans. April 19th, the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba failed. May 14th, civil rights protesters were beaten by a mob of KKK members. May 21st, Alabama Governor John Patterson declared martial law in an attempt to restore order in race riots that had broken out. We're just in May of that year, of 1961, okay? So then why in the world is 1961 remembered as a year of hope in America? <laughs> the reason 
is because on May 25, 1961, Kennedy said to a special session of Congress, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the day. And he did it on purpose. Why? Douglas Brinkley wrote a book called American Moonshot. And the whole book is about why Kennedy did what he did in the moment that he did it. This is what he says. World War II and the Cold War, he knew, had aged the country. With instincts reinforced by his own life experiences, he realized the United States needed youth and new frontiers. It needed energy, originality, optimism, and a sense of both individual achievement and teamwork. And then here's one of his conclusions. What Kennedy had miraculously done was bring together Americans on the political right and left in a collective, we're all in it together endeavor of great scientific merit. In other words, he knew there had to be some kind of uniting force of significance and accomplishment, and he believed that that would do it. Why am I telling you this? <laughs> what brings us together today is not just the Christ and the salvation that he brought us, but also our common struggles. That salvation is required because we all have sin and we all have needs. So when we come into this building, even though we may dress, uh, dress nicer and, and I've showered for the first time in two weeks and for most of us we have, uh, you, you know, we come in and we smile and we, but we also know that every one of us has difficulties going on. We're not the first people to have them going on and we're not the only people in this room to have difficulties going on. But one of the great things about the church is that Christ has not just saved us individually and then left us to do life alone. He has placed us into a collective body where not only are we saved, but we are continuing to be sanctified. We are continuing to be helped and chiseled and molded into the people we need to be, and we get to do that together. We get to do that together. It is that collective we're in this together thing that helps us, and this is where this turns the tables a little bit on this sermon because so far we've looked at these are the ways that you are uniquely positioned for ministry. This is you. This is the way, this is things only you can do in the way that you can do it. But rather than just zooming in on the individual, it's also important to recognize in this chapter that all of these people were not just uniquely positioned to do what only they could do. They were also uniquely positioned in a network. Hathak, Mordecai, Esther, all of their collective efforts brought this together. Yes, Esther makes the big move, we know. If I perish, I perish, and she goes to the king. But Mordecai told him about the plot. Hathak faithfully relayed the message to Esther, and then Esther moved in what she did. So they were not just uniquely positioned to do what they did. They had a unique network. One of the most significant things about ministry is not just what you can do to serve God, but who you're going to do it with. Who are the people in your life that you work together with for ministry? So one of the questions we should ask ourselves is, how am I uniquely positioned with the people around me for ministry? Who are the people in my life that God has strategically placed me near to help equip me? Who's the perfect spiritual mentor? And you just need to ask, them. who is the person in your life that's right there waiting for you to say, you'll mentor them? Who could you ask this week? Who could you invite to lunch? And, and begin to disciple that person. Who has the, been through similar things to you? And you know that, and you know they're going through similar struggles, and maybe it's time for you to share. Maybe it's time for you to tell them. Maybe it's time for you to talk with them and walk with them through those things. Who is somebody that maybe you're nervous to talk to about the gospel? Maybe you want to. Maybe you feel unqualified. Maybe you feel nervous. But take somebody with you. Jesus sent them out in twos, right? Who are the people together with you that you, you could ask this week? Say, hey, I'd like to talk to this person about the gospel. I don't feel completely equipped to do it, but would you study with us? Like, can you, can you go with me and we can talk to them together? Why not do it as a team? One of the best ways that the church operates is when we do those things together. When Esther agrees to go to the king, she does something pretty frustrating. She doesn't go to the king. <laughs> she says, she says, we're going to fast and pray for three days. How long would drive you nuts to know that your entire race of people are about to be obliterated? You're the person that needs to go talk to the king about it. Like, wouldn't most of us, I mean, the statistics on patience say that most of us would just get it out there. But Esther says, no, no, we're going to pray. We're going to fast for three days. This sits on her mind for three days. You know when you have something that's really big that you've got to do, and it's like part of it is not, the worst part is not doing it, 
It's having to wait. Like a lot of times if I'm asked to do something that's going to make me really nervous, like sometimes I'd rather just be asked like 10 minutes before it's going to happen rather than a month before it's going to happen. And I have to go a month waiting on it to happen. Like we just want to get it done now. But she says, no, 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 no. It's wiser to pray and to fast for three days. So she does it. Sometimes when we talk about making courageous moves to do what we ought to do in the moment, sometimes the hardest move is not making one. <laughs> when you've done everything that you can do in a situation, and now you pray and you wait. You could try to get it done faster by doing it an easier way and compromising what God's plan has in mind. But it's harder to wait, to wait on God. Sometimes haste makes waste. You look at Sarah and Abraham, Sarah and Abraham, and they don't wait on the promise. They try to speed it up with Hagar, and it causes a family feud all the way down to Middle Eastern views today. It's still real. Sometimes you, you live long enough, and you look back on your life, and you go, yeah, I could have slept on that. <laughs> I could have asked God more. I could have prayed more. I could have asked more people for advice. I could have waited. If I had waited, things would have turned out better. If I had trusted that God was going to do this and not try to push it through myself, uh, things would have been better. But Esther waits. <laughs> she waits incredibly long. Not only does she wait those days, she waits even further. If you take a look at uh, Esther 5, look at verse 1. Esther 5, verse 1. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace in front of the king's quarters while the king was sitting on his royal throne inside the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. And the king said to her, What is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you, even half of the kingdom... And Esther said, Haman is a horrible person and you need to stop it. Wouldn't that be basically what you would want to do? Like you got past the, am I going to die? And the king says, what do you want? Do I have the kingdom? I'll give it to you. And she goes, let's do a feast. Verse 4, Esther said, if it please the king, let the king and Haman come today to a feast that I have prepared for the king. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly so that we may do as Esther has asked. So the king and Haman came to the feast that Esther had prepared. Elon Musk has called for a six-month hiatus from a thousand different AI developers on developing any more AI as good as chat, GPT, 4, 5 version. I don't know what it is. Why? Why is he called for that? Because he considers it a fundamental threat to human civilization. Why? Well, have you seen Terminator? No, um, he, <laughs> he said his, his is not really as much about they're going to develop robots that want to take over the world. For him, 300 million full-time jobs around the world could be automated in some way by the latest AI, according to Goldman Sachs. Uh, approximately two-thirds of jobs in U.S. and Europe are exposed to some degree of AI automation, and up to a quarter of all work could be done by AI completely. So what Elon has said, and whether you like the guy or you don't, and I'm not really sure if I've figured him out, but Elon Musk is saying, look, the means to the end here is that we further and better civilization with technology. Let's not progress to progress. If this is going to hurt human civilization, let's back up before we do something that becomes our undoing. Let's not do that. We've come to times in our lives where we do that same type of deal, where we back up and we say, whoa, 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 whoa. This is not the first time. AI is one more new development in our development as human beings throughout the centuries where we have gone so far so fast and not thought about the consequences of what we're about to do. And for us as human beings, as individuals, oftentimes haste really does make waste. Uh, and when it comes to waiting on God, of course, that's going to – yeah, she heard the keywords uh, and the slide change. Uh, it, that's going to definitely be the case, right? But see, here's the deal. We know that, don't we? Like, we intuitively know that the things that are worth something in life, things that are really of true value, take sacrifice and time. Like, we get that. We know that shortcuts often lead to not so great stuff. We know that, and we know that we teach that to our kids. You know, anything worth doing is worth doing right. You know, we say those things to our kids because we know that. So then why is it that we have such a hard time waiting? It's because we often allow ourselves to be driven by what we feel rather than what we know. 
Just because you know that it's probably better to wait doesn't mean you like the feeling of the unknown anymore. It's still, it's still scary. You don't, you, I want to know how it's going to end, and I want to know how it's going to end now. I want an answer to what this is going to be like and how it's going to turn out. And so I don't want to wait. If there is a way to get rid of the unknown, I want to do it. So I'm driven more by my emotion than what I know. This is why the Bible is such an incredible thing for us. Because the Bible is full of people who felt fear and acted on what they knew instead. It's full of people who were afraid of what was going to happen and yet trusted. Yeah, fear got in Peter's way, but he did step out of the boat, right? My initial fear would be, I'm not, I mean, I'm going to die in this boat, <laughs> in this storm. I'm not going to step out onto the water. Noah did not know all of the things that were going to take place. Esther did not know all the things that were going to take place. That So many people had to wait for long periods of time not knowing. Joseph imprisoned multiple times before he saw the end of his dreams actually come to pass. Jesus' patience was unbelievable. First of all, he was sent at the right time. Galatians 4.4. 4. When time was full, God sent forth his son. Just the right time. But he, there's all of the waiting throughout his life. How do you wait so long knowing the end of the crucifixion? Like, how, like I said, when you've got something important to do, it's hard to focus on other stuff because that's just in the back of your mind. When you know the crucifixion is coming through your three-year ministry, what do you, how do you continue to function? How do you continue to minister? How do you continue to do that? And yet he patiently waits. On the cross, he's crucified for six hours. I mean, some people did not last past the scourging. And yet part of that allowed... For even the sacrifices in the temple and when they were being sacrificed and when Jesus' time ended and all the, the miraculous things that took place in that span of time that helped to verify that the Son of God was the one on the cross for us waiting through that. He's waiting now. Don't you think like when he left the disciples here on earth, it would have been one of those things where, you know, when you leave your kids, they're getting a little bit older and you're like, you're going to leave them home for the first time. You know, and you're like, ah, should we stay out for 10 minutes? Minute, you know, that kind of thing where you're about to leave people you really care about and you hope that they do the things you train them to do. I haven't sent my kids out to college yet, but I can imagine. You hope I'm sending them out on their own. Are they going to do the things I taught them to do? And so here's Jesus leaving, and he's leaving the disciples with this mission to evangelize the world and to spread and to start the church. And, and even now he is waiting. And I believe he wants to be with his people. And why does he wait? 2 Peter 3, 9 says he is patient. He is long-suffering because he wants people to come to the truth and not to perish. The truth is, James 1, 2 through 4 says patience is building us. It is perfecting us. So what that means is so often the end that God has in mind is not the place that he is getting us, but who he is making us on the way there. So one of the ways to help in the times where we have to wait, in the meantime, you know, between the time I've prayed and done everything I need to do, and when I, I find God's answer, there's this in the meantime. So in the meantime, what does the time mean? It's the question to ask. What does God want to do with this time? What does he want me to learn? How is he wanting me to grow? The reason that is significant to ask is because one of the reasons we hate the wait is because it often feels so purposeless to us. Like it's not just that we don't have an answer that we want or a conclusion that we want. We also feel like it's senseless. Why do we have to wait? Why can't we just do this or get it over with? Why won't God just answer? Now it's the, the senselessness and the waiting. It's like when you're on a long road trip with your kids and they're like, oh, wait there, oh, wait there. And sometimes Evie will complain. She's like, hey, wait, wait. I'm like, what do you want me to do? I want you to get us there. I am. Well, but, 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 uh, uh. well, what do you want me to do? And sometimes it's just like, I don't know. Like, I just want to yell. Like, it, you know, it just, but it feels so senseless or purposeless. And what do we say to them? Why don't you draw? Why don't you watch them? Why don't you play I Spy? Why do we tell them that? Because time passes faster. No, it doesn't. But when you inject purpose into the weight, it makes it more tolerable. The same thing is true of any weight. So now one of the worst things that makes a weight dreadful is that it feels senseless to have to wait. So when you ask the question, what does this time mean? What does God want me to learn through this waiting? How is he wanting me to grow through this waiting? Who is he wanting me to minister to through this? You've injected purpose into a situation that otherwise feels purposeless. And that takes the situation from being a dreadful, senseless thing to even though it's difficult, there is meaning in it. And that makes the wait more tolerable to ask what God wants us to do with it. 
I know you're waiting on me. You're exercising patience, and I get it. It's almost, we're almost to the end here. Here's the good news. The good news is that we're not in this together. We are. The good news is you're on your own. You know, the good news is we're not alone in this. That we are in it together. We can look at scripture and find people like Esther. We're the people that waited. And because she waited, things happened that she didn't even anticipate. She waited within her wisdom. She knew how to finagle with the king. He had to trust a woman in that, over a man in that time of big deal. She had to tr he had to trust her over his most trusted advisor, Haman. He had to trust a woman trying to usurp the authority of a man in position. When Vashti had already done that, that's why she was ousted. And all the men said, lest all the other women think they can raise up, you need to get rid of her. So they're on high alert for women trying to raise up in ways they don't want them to. So she knows she has to be tactful. So she waits. She's patient. In that time of waiting, the king can't sleep and reads the records about Mordecai saving the king's life. Now when she brings that plot before her, Mordecai's not just this insolent Jew. He's a man who saved his life. But would the king have had that time had Esther jumped right into it? No. So people benefit from it she didn't even anticipate. It's not always just about what God's doing with me, but with others in my life. You don't have to do it on our own. So I encourage you to ask yourself the question, to pray, to ask others the question. Say, what do you think God is trying to teach me at this time? And that makes it more talkable. All right, thank you.
we're ready to begin our devotional. I love to hear all the visiting that's going on. That's awesome. But let's have our devotional and then uh, we'll wrap things up here just a little bit and then you can just stay and visit as long as you want to. Let's sing His Yoke is Easy and then uh, Jeremy will come back and extend the invitation this evening. I felt Shutting his eyes, as it were, to the presence of sorrow or sickness or death, he might suppose that he was successfully evading them. That in other words, if I don't have the peasant's sadness in my presence, somehow I, it's not even there. And I can't help but think, how different is God as a king? How different is God as a king? Come before him reverently, yes, but come before him weeping your eyes out if you need to. Come before him 
dirty and unkempt, if that's where you find yourself when you're in need of prayer. Come to him pouring out your heart. Why? Because he's not bothered by your distress. He's not bothered by the issues that you have. In fact, he invites you to come, according to Hebrews 4.16, boldly before his throne to find help and to find mercy. Uh, to find mercy. If that's where you find yourself tonight, I hope that's what you'll do. If you need prayer, if you need to become a Christian, or maybe you're a Christian, but you haven't been using the place where you are in life like we talked about tonight, you haven't been the person that you need to be, or if you need prayer, we want to join you. In. If you have any, why don't you let us know? I am my This, uh, this new young guy preach. I know some of you guys have never heard of him, but he, uh, he, did, he did some justice to, to the text, and uh, I'm always so thankful to hear Jeremy Hall. I didn't get to hear him for, for you know, several years like you guys did. I, I get to hear him once a year now, which is, which is nice, uh, and I, I appreciate you, Jeremy, for coming and, and for the rest of your family for traveling over uh, and for the whole parents for staying here and giving him a reason to consistently come back. I appreciate y'all. I hope you guys are staying away from power tools this week. Uh, we have a few announcements that we want to go over very quickly. Uh, not in the bulletin this past week is uh, July 22nd is our water day for kids to come and have a slip and slide. There will be a bounce house. If you don't have kids, you can still come and hang out with the other adults. There will be lots of adults not going down the slip and slide. So um, Don Adams, you don't got to go down the slip and slide. That's fine. Michael Cox will be going down the slip and slide. So, you know, there, there's a wide range. Uh, in addition to that, there's a Bible drive that we want to remind you about. If you have any Bibles that are collecting dust on your shelves because you use electronic Bibles like so many of us, please uh, please bring them uh, sometime before Sunday, before or on Sunday, August 13th, because there are people who are desperately wanting physical copies of the Bible in uh, South Africa, and they will get use. And that, that's encouraging to me, the idea that we have some Bibles that aren't being used and they can find use somewhere. So if you can look through your bookshelf, find anything, and bring that, that would be greatly appreciated. We want to remind you that Stephanie Jones's back surgery is coming up on August 1st, and we want to pray for her as uh, that is approaching. And Linda Brown had knee, surgery, knee replacement surgery this Monday. I haven't heard any updates about that. Is, does anyone have any updates? It went well, but uh, she's not at home yet. She's, uh, she's staying for totally, I think, three days if everything goes well. It went well, but she's not home yet. She's going to be staying for a total of three days uh, if everything goes well. That is all the announcements that I have. Are there any other pressing announcements or prayer requests? Michael's got something for us.
recording and, and for anyone online, uh, Walt Lever uh, is, has a descending aortic aneurysm uh, and so is going to need to go through procedure. I think I got that right. So we we'll want to pray for him as well as the passing of Claudine Caldwell, uh, Dana, Dan, Dana Trenfens, um, Dana Tees. Traffenstadt. I, I always see it in writing. I, her mother and a longtime member here, and so we want to pray for family and friends. The funeral and visitation info for that was emailed out, uh, though the visitation is tomorrow, 3 to 8. Are there any other pressing announcements or prayer requests that need to be made? Dennis, thank you. Dennis Britt fell last week. Turns out he had COVID, and so he was real weak. He went to the hospital, but he's back home now. So it sounds like it was not a not too bad that uh, that there's anything lasting. Any other announcements or prayer requests that need to be made? All right. Will you join me in prayer? Our holy and righteous Father, we are so thankful that you have brought us here for this time that you have brought us here together to study your word and to be surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ and, and people who love you and that you've given us this opportunity to have the freedom to praise your name without fear of persecution, uh, at least not like it has been for so many people who have praised your name throughout history. And God, we ask that you open our eyes to the opportunities that you have put before us. Open our eyes to the situations that we are in, to the doors that are open, to the people that we can talk to and that we can be like Christ to so that we can encourage other people, teach other people about you and to, to populate heaven with people who love you and who are excited to praise you for eternity. Help us to take these words and ideas that we've heard from Jeremy tonight and to apply them, to remember to be a messenger despite whatever uh, persecution we may face for that, to, to not decide to sit silently, but decide to do something and, and to use the situations that we've been given to honor and glorify you in all things. Be with us as we go our separate ways and help us to have safety and good health so that we might return again to once again worship and praise you. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.